One of my favorite topics, thunderstorms, and uh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds, right? Multi-cell storms and all that. Take it away, Jacob. Yeah, so we are in thunderstorm season, severe weather season, actually, for many areas across the northern plains. Haven't had a whole lot of severe weather lately, but there are a different uh, multitude of thunderstorm types that we can go over. Single cell thunderstorms, we'll get into in next week's topic. Those are your garden variety pulse thunderstorms or even supercell thunderstorms that are most likely to produce tornadoes. This week, we'll be talking about multi-cell thunderstorms, those larger thunderstorm complexes, and what hazards those can possess. Yesterday, we actually had a pretty good example of multi-cell thunderstorms with this line of storms that formed in central North Dakota. And on initiation of these storms in north central South Dakota, you can see each one of these individual cells forming and then maintaining itself in a line as it progressed to the north and eventually made its way into the Bismarck Mandan area, produced some severe weather to the north and west of the metro area, but you can see each one of these individual cells growing, falling apart, sustaining a much larger complex, a multi-cell cluster of storms. So here's a schematic of what these multi-cell storms look like. You can have each one of these individual cells grow, dissipate, and form new cells back on the upwind side, and those clusters can grow even larger. So new updrafts form along the leading edge of rain-cooled air or the gust front, which we called a couple, uh, talked about a couple of weeks ago in Morse Code of Weather. So you have each one of these cells that form as they grow to a pretty large size and then dissipate that downdraft, the rain-cooled air, hits the ground and spreads out in all directions with our gust front. That can lead to more initiation of new thunderstorm cells nearby, and that's what we uh, deem the multi-cell cluster. And these individual cells usually last for 30 to 60 minutes, while the system as a whole can last for many hours. And these multi-cell storms can produce hail, strong winds, even brief tornadoes, and flash flooding if these storms go over the same areas for a prolonged period of time. So as we look at the schematic over a longer period of time, let's say for 20 minutes, you can see each one of these cells growing, forming new cells behind it as the uh, first ones dissipate. Uh, looking at a, a different view of these multi-cell clusters, the towering cumulus clouds form. We get our cumulonimbus clouds producing those strong thunderstorms and then dissipating as they lose that updraft. They become uh, downdraft dominant. We get uh, the rain-cooled air to descend to the ground. So each shell, cell carried is, down, is carried downstream by the upper level winds. So wherever the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere are moving, that's where these thunderstorm clusters will move with new cells forming upwind of those previous cells to take their place. So as they move or propagate forward, we can get new cells that form behind it or nearby. And that's when we can get training thunderstorms. So the speed that the multi-cell cluster moves in makes a big difference in rain totals. And we can get uh, cells that form in a line and go over the same location, and each one of those thunderstorms produce a lot of heavy rainfall that adds up and can lead to flash flooding, forming in a line, think of like train tracks. So as these individual cells move downstream, additional cells form behind that and move directly over the path of those previous cells. You have saturated soils at that point that can lead to flash flooding a lot quicker. You can also get back building storms when new cells form so fast that each new cell develops farther upstream so that we see that this multi-cell cluster is either just stationary or even moving backwards. When you have a lot of instability in the atmosphere, you can get these cells to almost remain stationary, form uh, big cl thunderstorm clusters over one area and really dump a whole lot of rain in a quick amount, uh, fast amount of time. So once we get a little bit more arranged with these multi-cell clusters, we can produce squall lines. Usually this happens along a linear forcing mechanism like a cold front, and that can produce really damaging straight line winds, but they do pass rather quickly. They can produce shelf clouds that you see on the leading edge of these squall lines. They can be hundreds of miles long, but typically only about 10 to 20 miles wide. And these squall lines are a little bit different when we look at this schematic. We can see that the updraft is tilted a little bit, uh, and they continually reform along the leading edge with the rain and hail falling behind. So this allows that updraft to remain sustained as it pushes forward over a certain area. 
and with a specific type of squall line called a derecho. These are long-lived, very strong squall lines that can travel hundreds of miles across a large area. We can get them around here, but they're a little bit more common closer to the Midwest and the Great Lakes. Along these squall lines, we get bow echo segments, these backward C shapes, and this is where the damaging wind threat is greatest. That's where the storms are moving forward most quickly, and we can even get a little bit of rotation on the edges of these uh, bow echo segments, leading to brief quick spin-up tornadoes, and that's something we have to watch for when we're watching these squall lines come across an entire area. These multi-cell clusters can produce severe weather, so something to be aware of. So true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, severe thunderstorm chances, minimal next couple of days, but we all know that, but we all know, as I give you the forecast coming up, <laughs> that we got a good chance for thunderstorms in the coming days. Exactly. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. You're welcome.